This is chapter five for scat. The Truman School had once been known as the Trapwick Academy, named after the man who had founded it 18 years earlier. Vincent Z. Trapwick was a rich Rhode Island banker who had moved to Southwest Florida and gotten even richer. Vincent Trapwick didn't want his three snotty pampered children attending school with ordinary kids. So he started his own private school and kept out just about everyone who didn't have the same skin color, religion, or political view as Vincent Trapwick. As a result, the Trapwick Academy had a ridiculously small enrollment and lost money by the bucketful. Although Vincent Trapwick didn't seem to care, when he died, he left $200,000 to the school, which was a generous amount, but hardy enough to keep it running forever. So the board of trustees gradually loosened up the admissions policy and began reaching out to the community, recruiting all kinds of students. For the first time, scholarships were offered to bright kids and athletes whose families couldn't afford the expense of tuition. Enrollment grew steadily and so did the Trapwick Academy reputation. Things were rolling along smoothly until Vincent Trapwick's own kids, now graduated and grown to adulthood, started getting into trouble. The eldest, Vincent Jr., was caught embezzling millions of dollars from his late father's bank to support wild gambling junkets to Monaco. The middle one, Sandra Sue, on three occasions, had too much and drove off a golf cart of the Naples Pier. The youngest, Iggy, was arrested for ripping off Social Security checks from old folks living in chains of shabby nursing homes that he owned. The name Trapwick kept popping up all over the newspapers and not in any way that was flattering to the Trapwick Academy. Ironically, the same spoiled children whom the school was created for had grown to become its most embarrassing advertisements. In an emergency meeting held late one night with Iggy, after Iggy Trapwick had been stopped at the Sarasota airport the, um, and got arrested, the board of trustees voted ambiguously to change the academy name. They, close to, they chose to call it Truman School after President Harry S. Truman, who had been dead for a long time and therefore was unlikely to cause any public relations problems. To save money, the board voted not to replace the entire granite salute to Vincent Z. Trapwick that stood in front of the school auditorium. Instead, a local sculpture was hired to chisel off Vincent Trapwick's face and reshape the remaining nub of stone into the study studious feature of the 33rd president of the United States. The sculptor did the best he could working on a tight schedule and a low budget. The statue's new face was distinguished enough, but small as a kitten's. Unfortunately, the finished piece did not have a bearing strike resemblance to Harry S. Truman. The body was still all wrong and nothing could be done about it. Vincent Z. Trapwick had weighed 250 pounds while President Truman only weighed 175. President as a result, most people viewing the school statue for the first time had no idea who it was supposed to be. When Nick and Marta stepped off the bus, three sheriff de deputies were standing by the old granite figure, gesturing aloud to the identity. What's going on? Marta said to Nick. Don't ask me. Maybe it's just say no day. Say, just say no day. Once a year, the Truman School brought in police officers, doctors, and counselors to speak to the students about drugs and alcohol abuse. However, the three deputies acted like they were on call. They carried clipboards and had their portable radios turned on. Something's up, said Marta. Nick agreed. Maybe there was another break-in. Over the Christmas holidays, burglars had stolen several laptops from the school computer lab. The culprits were two teenage brothers from Fort Myers who were later caught speeding through the red light and the missing laptop stacked in the bed of his father's pickup truck. The kids had confessed that they intended to pawn the computers and use the money to buy video games. Marta nudged Nick and told him to ask the deputies why they were here. Probably because his dad was a military officer. Nick had no problem dealing with authority figures, except for Mrs. Starch. As he approached one of the deputies, he heard them joking about the Harry Truman statue looking like a bowling pin in an overcoat. Excuse me, Nick interrupted in politely. Did something happen here at school this morning? Caught by surprise, the deputy suddenly got serious. We can't talk about it. Your principal will make an announcement. The headmaster, you mean, Nick said? Same difference. The first bell rang and students started pouring into the auditorium. 
Marta and Nick found an empty row in the back. Usually the morning assembly was incredibly boring, a good opportunity to finish your homework, but, or to return your text messages. After the daily blessing, which seemed to drag on forever, Dr. Dressler approached the podium and said he had a short statement to read. He unfolded a sheet of paper and began. Some of you know yesterday's field trip to the Black Vine Swamp was ended early because a wildfire broke out in the area. Nick snapped shut his algebra book and sat up. Marta turned off her cell phone. All Truman students were evacuated promptly and returned to the campus safely, Dr. Dressler went on. However, one of our biology teachers, Mrs. Starch, went back down the hiking path to retrieve a student's medicine. She didn't return to school and hasn't been seen, so we have no... We have reason to believe she might have gotten lost or had to spend the night in the swamp. The murmur rippled through the auditorium. Middle Marta pinched Nick and said, oh my gosh. Nick's mind was racing. He hadn't yet told Marta that he and his mother had seen the videotape and that he thought what was a panther was actually a human being scrambling through the cypresses. Now Nick couldn't help but wonder if that mystery figure wearing the dark belt the person who probably made the creepy animal cry was involved in Mrs. Starch's disappearance. What if it was smoke, he thought. What if he went crazy and did something awful? Nick pried Marta's fingers from his arm. The authorities were out here at daybreak to continue searching for Mrs. Starch, Dr. Dressler continued from the stage. Fortunately, the fire went out and the weather last night was mild, so there's no reason to believe she's in any danger. The search teams were experiences and th were exper are experienced and very thorough, and I'm confident of a po positive outcome. Nick whispered, I don't see smoke anywhere. Marta looked up and down the rows of heads in the auditorium. He's probably just late, she said. He's always late for assembly. Yeah, this is so freaky, Nick. Marta puffed her cheeks out and let the air hiss out. I mean, I can't stand the woman, but to think that she got lost in the swamp... At the podium, Dr. Dressler turned the paper over and continued reading. You've probably noticed some law enforcement officers on campus this morning. Please do not be alarmed or make any rash assumptions. It's routine procedure in such cases. Students in Mrs. Starch's classes and others who went on the field trip may be called aside to chat with the deputies today. I encourage you to be as helpful as you can. Marta said, I better call my mom. What for, Nick said, in case there's going to be something on TV, she's going to wig out. Dr. Dresser concluded his pre prepared statement and moved on to less exciting announcements about the upcoming soccer tournament, a change in the lunch menu, and a new rule for the class dress code banned all styles of open-toed sandals on campus. The students weren't listening. They were buzzing about Mrs. Starch. The mood in the auditorium was one restless curiosity, not worry. Thanks to the headmaster's reassuring speech, most of the kids believed that the searchers would soon locate the missing teacher. Once Mrs. Starch was found, the Black Vine Swamp episode would only add to her colorful legend. After assembly, Nick and Marta stood up by the Harry Truman st statue waiting for the bell. Libby Marshall rushed over, highly agitated. Dr. Dresser was wrong. Mrs. Starch isn't lost. She got out of the glades last night, Libby blurted. I've got to tell him so he can put this on the inter intercom. You saw her? Where? Marta asked. Libby shook her head. I didn't see her. But she stopped by my house and left this on the porch. Libby displayed her asthma inhaler like a trophy. Sam found it. He's our dog. Nick said, did anybody actually see her? No, but Sam heard her and the footsteps and started barking like crazy. Who else could it be? She's the one who went back in to find my inhaler. Although Nick didn't like Mrs. Starch any more than the other students did, he had been hoping that she, w he had been hoping that she wasn't hurt or worse. Libby's news was very encouraging. I wonder why she didn't knock, he said. Because it was late, Libby said impatiently, and the lights were off. She probably didn't want to wake anybody up. That makes sense to Nick and Marta. Now I've got to go find Dr. Droopy Dr. Dressler, said Libby, and straighten him out, she hurried off. The bell rang and Marta picked up her backpack. I gotta admit, I'm glad that the mean old hag made it out of the swamp okay. Me too, Nick said. I didn't know why I should care as much as I, what happened to her because she was doing a brave thing, going back for Libby's medicine into the wildfire coming? Marta shrugged. Yeah, even witches have their good days. Dr. Dresser was hopeful but perplexed. After the assembly, he received a call from the fire lieutenant who reported that Bunny Starch's blue Prius was gone at daybreak when the crews had returned to the Black Vine Swamp. 
the lieutenant surmised that sometime during the night, Mrs. Starch maybe found her way back to her car. The theory was holstered by the information from Libby Marshall, who burst into Dr. Dressler's office and blurted the story out about the asthma inhaler so breathlessly that he feared she might need to use it. The fact strongly suggested that Mrs. Starch was alive and had safely exited the wilderness. How else would Libby's lost medicine have made a delivery to her front porch? What nagged Dr. Dresser was that nobody actually saw or spoke to the biology teacher. She hadn't shown up for classes that morning, which, given the circumstances, was totally excusable. Yet, she didn't even call to say she'd be absent, and that was a violation of the Truman faculty attendance policy, and nobody was a bigger stickler for any school rule than Mrs. Starch. In 18 years, she's missed one day of teaching when she accidentally rolled her car while swerving to avoid a rabbit on the way to school. She borrowed the ambulance driver's radio call to call in sick, and the next day she returned to Truman with a plaster cast on one arm and a patch over the other eye and two metal pins in her collarbone. After Libby left the office, Dr. Dresser immediately tried calling Mrs. Starch's cell phone and calling and calling and calling. Then he phoned her house. No answer there, either. It was baffling. Dr. Dressler reluctantly agreed that the sheriff deputies would go ahead and interview the students. Technically, at least, Bunny Starch was still a missing person. After speaking with Libby, Nick, and Marta, expect, expected Mrs. Sparch to be waiting in the pencil twirling a biology class, they were surprised to see Miss Moffett sitting at Mrs. Starch's desk, and even more surprised when a sheriff deputy poked his head in the doorway and asked for Dwayne Screw Jr., Miss Moffett said, Dwayne's absent today. All right, the deputy scanned the clipboard. How about Graham Carson? Graham eagerly raised his hand. The deputy motioned for him to come along. Graham was beaming self-importantly as he marched from the room. I don't get it, Marta murmured to Dick. What's with the cops? Don't they have the old birds okay? <laughs> Nick was mystified as well. If Mrs. Starch was safe, why are the deputies banging around and asking questions? Another uninformed officer entered the classroom and called Marta's name. Her eyes widened and she looked fretful at Nick. She said, no big deal. He said, no big deal. Just tell him what you know. After a few minutes, Marta returned and, looking annoyed, plopped down at her desk. I told him Mrs. Starch was all right, but she just kept on asking me questions. Like what, Nick said. No talking, please, said Miss Moffat sternly as she pointed to the blackboard. Reread chapter eight. Libby Marshall was called out next, and Nick assumed that he, she'd be the final interview. Once Libby told them that Mrs. Starch had delivered the asthma inhaler that night, the deputies would realize there was nothing to investigate. But Libby came back to class red-faced and fuming. Nick wondered what in the world was going on. One by one, the remainder of Mrs. Starch's biology students were summoned. Sometimes the interviews were short, and sometimes they lasted a while. There were so many interruptions from the kids coming in and out, it was so difficult to concentrate on the Calvin cycle or any other topic in the biology book. Nick was the last one to be called, and he was led, on, he was led to an empty classroom by the same female deputy to whom he had spoken with near the Truman statue. The deputy told Nick to sit down, which he did, and relax, which was impossible. Let's go over what happened on the field trip yesterday, she said. Balancing on her lap was a clipboard holding a blank report form upon which she printed Nick's full name. When Mrs. Starch turned back to look at the young to look for the young lady's asthma inhaler, you're sure she was alone. Yes, I saw her walking down the boardwalk all by herself, Nick said. The deputy scribbled down on the paper. Nick added, she must be all right because she brought back Libby's inhaler last night. Did you know about that? The deputy nodded and kept writing. Then I don't get the point of this, Nick said. Let's go back to the day before the field trip said the deputy. I want to ask you something about what happened in class between Mrs. Starch and the boy named Dwayne Scrooge. Nick felt his muscles in his neck stiffen. She pointed the pencil down at him. He bit this in half? Didn't he also, didn't he also threaten her? What do you mean? The deputy said, some of your classmates said, remember, some of your classmates remember Dwayne saying something like, you're going to be sorry. Isn't that a threat? Do you recall that conversation? Nick recalled it Quite clearly, he also recalled worrying that snipe, snow, ugh. he also recalled worrying that smoke might be serious. Nick felt uneasy telling this to the deputy because he couldn't be sure what Dwayne Scrooge had meant. But Nick's father had taught him to always be truthful, no matter how hard it might be. 
Mrs. Starch told Duane to write 500 words about pimples, Nick began, and that's no joke. The deputy obviously hadn't heard about the essay from the other students because she displayed no reaction. She obviously had heard about the essay. Nick went on. Then Duane said something like, you'll be sorry or whatever. He was mad. Kids say things stupid and stuff all the time when they're mad. The deputy took a few more notes. Does Duane have a nickname? She asked as if she didn't already know. Smoke, Nick said. Why do they call him that? Because that's what he wants to be called. The deputy glanced up. Some of the other classmates said that he has a pyro, that he's a pyromaniac because he likes to mess with fire. I don't know. We don't hang together, Nick said. But you've heard that rumor, right? Nick could sense that the deputy wanted him to say that Dwayne was a nutcase. I thought you wanted me to stick to what I saw and what I know, he said. I didn't think you were interested in rumors. The deputy raised her eyebrows. Sometimes rumors turn out to be true, Nick. Can I go back to class? She said the wildfire at the Black Vine Swamp wasn't really a wildfire. It was arson. What? The investigators called it a controlled burn. Whoever set the fire dug a trench line on the other side so it would burn itself out. They knew what they were doing, the deputy said. Nick was dumbfounded. The deputy tapped her pen lightly at the clipboard. Do you think Dwayne ever could have done something like this to get back at Mrs. Starch for what happened in class? Light a brush fire to freak her out and spoil the field trip? I have no idea, Nick said honestly. In his mind, he was now replaying the glimpse of the tannish blur in the cypress trees. The panther that turned out to be a human. Maybe it was smoke. Nick kept his thought to himself. He needed to go home and look at the videotape of the swamp prowler again. The deputy went on. Dwayne was pretty angry about that essay, wasn't he? Sure, said Nick, thinking. Who wouldn't be angry? Mrs. Starch was totally humiliating him. Were you aware that Dwayne got in trouble once for burning down a construction trailer out near Imbolki? He was only 10 years old when it happened, the deputy said. Another time he caught himself, he, they caught him torching a billboard on the interstate using mops dipped in gasoline. Three in the morning, a state trooper busted him. Are you serious? Nick was stunned. Those weren't typical dumb kid pranks. Those were crimes. Are you afraid of Dwayne? The deputy asked. Not really. He doesn't hassle anyone. Was Mrs. Starch afraid of him? Nick had to chuckle at that one. The deputy asked was really funny. He said, if you meet Mrs. Starch, you'll think that's pretty funny too. The deputy scribbled down another few lines and then capped her pen. Nick, do you have any idea where we might find Dwayne? Nick firmly shook his head. Nope, and that's the truth. The deputy rose. Thanks for your help. I don't know that I really, I really don't know the guy at all, Nick insisted. That's the thing. Nobody seems to know him, do they? And she opened the door and motioned for Nick to leave. End of chapter five.